just a couple additions to uh, one to the announcements and another announcement. Um, John Bentley, when he comes and speaks, uh, I mean, we're we're telling you that he's a, a missionary. Um, he's going to come and share and shock you about faith. He's going to challenge you in your faith because he's a man of faith. Um, and, uh, and he's going, you know, he's not just going to come and share about all the things that they're doing. Uh, he's going to share about, uh, you know, what the Lord is doing through their ministry and has done. I don't know exactly what he's going to share, but I know that he caused me to grow and has caused me to grow a lot in my Christian walk in faith, you know, because, uh, you know, um, he stepped out by faith to go to China with $5,000 in his bank account after being a lawyer up in Washington State driving a Porsche. And God said, drop it all and go be a missionary in China. And so he did. And when he ran out of the $5,000, he was still in China. And God started a ministry called Harmony Ministries out of that. And it was adoption for kids uh, that uh, were left for dead. Uh, kids that had uh, cleft palates, they would get money for them to get surgery for them. They just did a lot of outreach in China, and now the doors have closed there, but that's, that's how he got going. He went all the way through law school by faith. I mean, you know, he was in the Army, but God provided the money all the way through law school, and so he went from being, you know, a guy driving a Porsche to a guy in a sandpan you know, going up the, you know, Shanghai River. <laughs> um, you know, so he's got quite a testimony. And he will encourage you in your faith to trust God for greater things. When he asks you to go and when he asks you to do things, uh, that God is absolutely 100% faithful. And uh, so he has greatly encouraged me, so I... Please don't check it off and say, no, I don't want to hear about missions. It's not, a, it's not just about missions. And the other thing is uh, the former assistant pastor of this church, Lauren Golbronson, is in Minnesota as we speak, visiting his father. And he may be coming by here uh, next couple of weeks. So... Um, He's going to let me know, but uh, I think he helped you learn, didn't he? He was a musician and uh, uh, quite a guy. Uh, he did a lot of different things. He was the mime at SeaWorld. So if you ever went to SeaWorld in the 80s, you saw Lauren. But you didn't hear him talk because he was a mime, you know. And he did stuff at the zoo. He was on the dating game, and he gave up uh, an acting career to serve the Lord. And uh, so, great guy. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the addition to the announcements. Um, once again, Rock'em Sock'em Robots with James. You know, this is, uh, James is a straightforward sort of a guy. He, he's like, uh, you know, if you don't like it, get over it, grow up, you know. So uh, he's the writer. I'm just the expositor, and hopefully, you know, out of all this, he will. we, we will be encouraged by the time we get to the end of the message. Uh, because God is absolutely faithful. But uh, so we're in uh, James chapter 1, um, and we're going to start with verse 12. By way of a little bit of background here, um, when Adam sinned, uh, 
it affected everything from the blade of grass to the farthest star. It did. The Bible says that all creation groans until the redemption of what? The saints. It does. Uh, Everything has been affected by sin. And everything continues to be affected by sin. We just happen to live in a world that, you know, we, we see sin, blatant sin, but sometimes, you know, the not-so-blatant sins, we just live with them. They're just there. You know, it's part of uh, an old nature that we have, and, and uh, sometimes we do things sow things, uh, sowing being spending time with, you know, living in areas that we say, no, oh, it won't affect me, no big deal. It does. It does. Every sin has a cause. There's, a, there's an effect. The cause of sin, the effect is something that comes my way down the road. And thank God for grace. Thank God for forgiveness. It's not that that those aren't there. They are. And uh, the Bible encourages us to walk in the spirit. We will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Well, the only way you're going to walk in the spirit is if you're born of the spirit of God. And that's, that's the promise of the Bible is that I can be born again. And, uh, you know, there's some dramatic testimonies in this room. Not for me to share. I I got my own, but you've heard enough of mine. But the point is, is that God does a a work, a change of heart. And he gives uh, men and women a heart for him, to relate to him. It's called being born from above or born again. Um, so do you think that Adam had regret just think about it after he sinned and he looked and he watched what all the thorns and the thistles and all that stuff come up and he had to go out there and now he's kicked out of the garden Uh, probably the greatest regret was when Cain killed Abel and that was, the, that was affected by sin. That's how that was produced. There was regret. And there wasn't anything he could do about it. Nothing. He couldn't change the course of the actions that he produced that produced the what? The fruit that he saw, the consequences that he saw. And in our own lives, just in a room with uh, you, there is enough consequences here. Most of us have suffered consequences because of choices. Well, that'd be before Christ and maybe some of it after Christ. But we've suffered those consequences and we go, man, why? You know? And uh, think about David. David's on the rooftop. Innocent enough, it's his roof. It's a patio in Jerusalem, Israel. It's where their patios are. He goes out on his patio, and a couple houses below him is uh, another patio with a woman bathing. He had one or two choices at that point. Keep looking. Or what? As it says in 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, peace, and love with those who call on a pure heart. Eh, That means go get some fellowship somewhere. Go get accountable. Go do something other than stand there. Because if you stand there and keep looking, something's going to happen. And it ain't going to be good. But he blew all that off. And uh, you guys, if you know your Bible, you know the consequences of it. 
for the fling of one night. She gets pregnant. Then he tries to cover that sin. And he murders Uriah. And then the consequences of that sin affected his own family where his own sons are murdering each other. One of his sons rapes one of his daughters, his half-sister. The consequences followed David most of the rest of his life. You think there was regret? Yeah, I think so. Samson. Samson played games. He thought he was covered under grace. I can do whatever I want. You know, I'm all powerful. I'm Samson. I don't need a girl from Israel. I can go over to the Philistine girls. They look much finer, and I like the clothes that they wear. And there's Delilah, and he played games, and he played games, and he played games, and he finally told her the secret of his power. Foolish man. His hair is cut off, and he thinks he's just going to stand up and throw the Philistines off. Well, guess what? His power was gone. He had played games one too many times. And they bound him. And he was blinded. And he spent the rest of his life acting like a, 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 an oxen milling out grain. That's literally being yoked to a, a stone that would roll. And he had to walk in this circle and they would throw out the grain so that it would be crushed so they could make Wonder Bread from Wonder Boy. It's sad. It's tragic. He has one redeeming moment. Lord, one more time. It says he killed more in that one moment when he knocked down the pillars than he did all the other time when he was playing games. Foolish. You think there was regret? <laughs> yeah, there would be regret. How did I get here? Well, he got there because of what? Choices? Old nature that got the better of him? He was deceived, self confident, and it brought tragedy. We could run through the list. I could go on and on here. But the whole story of all of this is new nature, old nature. If you're born again here today, you have a new nature. You can obey that new nature. You can feed that new nature. Doesn't mean you won't have certain trials that will come your way. But you'll be able to overcome those trials but if you're walking in the old nature, ain't ever going to happen. Tragedy will come. Regret will come. And a lot of people have taken the position to say, well, you know, I'll just sin it up and ask for forgiveness. Oh, you may be covered under the blood, but that doesn't mean that consequences won't come. Right? And... Uh, so our, our, our text deals with a word called temptation. Um, but believe it or not, it's the same word as previously used of trial. And uh, we'll explain that as we go. But uh, so if you're with me, we'll start with verse 12. Uh, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So, blessed. What does blessed mean? Oh, how happy to be envied. It's the same in the Beatitudes. Oh, how happy to be envied. 
So it's telling us, blessed is a man who endures temptation. And so it's an endurance in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, dealing with temptation. Um, as I have told you, uh, the word for temptation is the same work word as um, verse 2, uh, when you fall into various trials. Same word. Same exact Greek word. You look it up in Strong's. And you're like, how can one be a temptation and one is a trial? It depends on the perspective. You see, God doesn't tempt anybody with evil we're going to hear. Right? Because he can't be tempted by evil himself. There's nothing within him to say, oh boy, I want to sin. He has no tug. He has no pull. He's holy. So that means it's impossible for him to tempt someone with evil, even though some people want to take the Bible and say God's responsible for all things. No, he's not responsible for temptation. Blatantly tells us that. Um, God would expect us to overcome. He would expect us to respond to what we call temptation as a test, as a trial. And so you go back to the previous uh, message, but he would expect us to do that because it, uh, it says, when he has been approved. Approved of what? Victorious against the trial, against the, that which has become a temptation. So what makes a trial a temptation? Well, um, it's who is soliciting. It's who's soliciting. God doesn't solicit to evil, but is there somebody else that solicits to evil? Absolutely. You know, uh, the devil made me do it. Anybody remember uh, Flip? Flip? Thanks. Yeah, Flip Wilson. Well, the devil only uses what's within me, which is a lure, to actually get me to that place. Old nature stuff. That's where David stood on the rooftop a little too long looking down at his neighbor. You see, had he turned around and ran away and done the right thing, guess what? He would have overcame. It would have been a trial. But he didn't. He stood there a little too long and his old nature what kicked right in and he went wow and the gear started going I think I'll invite her up for a drink thinking that that would be innocent enough we'll just have a little drink together yeah sure right sad sad so he says, endures, to stand my ground, show endurance. I endure, bear up against, I persevere. Things come my way, trials or temptations, depending on who's doing the, you know, knocking on the door. And if it's a devil knocking on the door, then I am to do what? Bear up underneath of these things and persevere in the Lord. Uh, that's, that's the way that you do this. Um, God expects us to be approved and found to be genuine in our faith. That's what he expects. Okay? Has he given us things to be able to do that? Absolutely, he has. We'll explore that. Um, it tells us right here, he says, um, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, 
there's two different ways to read this. A lot of commentators and, and uh, theologians and teachers say this is yet a crown that is down the road. I do not believe that. In fact, there's a, a, a man, Curtis Vaughn, in his Bible study commentary, uh, and I believe that, that the, the word of God bears this out, this is life here and now and the benefits of that life as I walk with the Lord in a victorious fashion. And you can find that in the Psalms. You can find that in the Old Testament. You can see that fulfilled in the Old Testament. David writes about it in the Psalms many times. And God writes about life. The whole intent of the law Old Testament, not that we're under it, but the whole intent of the law is that they would walk in it and they would be blessed. You could read Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is full of, hey, I'll bless your kneading bowl. I'll bless your children. I'll bless your business. I'll bless all of these other different things if you just walk in my laws. And so what is that? That's life. That's life that God wanted the children of Israel to have. It is the same life that he wants us to have, although we are under a different dispensation. We are not Jewish in the sense of under the law, nor does all of that apply to us. But at the same time, who here does not want to be blessed? I want to be blessed, right? And if I walk with the Lord and I overcome, will I not be blessed? I mean, I, there is such a thing as grace. We understand grace. But at the same time, there is a blessing that overtakes those who walk with the Lord and a humble walking in the Spirit. And the greatest victory is what? I will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, so I will not be continually sowing and reaping consequences in my life. And if you think that is the case, perish that thought. That's deception. God does not want you to sow to your flesh so you can constantly reap consequences from your flesh. Um, let me give you a, a, an example. Joseph being a prime example of a man who overcame, I believe, more than one temptation. Um, I'll just read you from 39, 7 through 9 of the book of Genesis. It came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. He has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in his house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it's going to tell us, guess what? That's how we overcome. If you love God, that's how you're going to overcome. If you don't love God, then you don't care. You're not going to be worried about it. Consequences will still come. But loving God is the first and foremost primary thing that I need to do. Because then I'm going to deal with temptation according to what? This relationship and not this, what? This plane, right? And many people live on this plane and only take advantage of this one when they're in trouble. Well, guess what? That's not a good way to live. It's best to deal with this one first because then you have a new nature 
and a new power to be able to deal with this. Consider Joseph. What did he have? He's Potiphar's servant. He had the temptation of money. He had the temptation of power. And he overcame them. He was absolutely faithful because he loved God. No pilfering. And here comes his wife. Lie with me. She longing eyes. Joseph's, you know, back in the back, and she's looking around the corner. Hi, honey. You know. And Joseph overcomes. And why did he overcome? I can't sin against God. It wasn't just a law. It was, man, I, I have a God that I serve, and if I, I, I don't, I don't want to displease him. Now, it got him into greater trouble initially, which I'm sure he had a question mark about, but so he ends up in prison. But he ends up in charge in prison. You think there was no temptation there to abuse his power? There was, but that's not what he did. He was faithful to God. And God had a day when he said, trial's over, buddy. Time to get you out of here. And so they took him from the prison to Pharaoh's presence to becoming, I don't know if you would call him the prime minister or whatever he was, but he was second only to Pharaoh. And then he had all the wealth and everything that he could possibly ever want and he could abuse it as much as he wanted because he was what he had pharaoh's ring and you would think that he would act on his brothers when they showed up and went boy am i gonna get them back and it would seem that maybe he did but he didn't he needed to prove and find out where their hearts were that's just the story of Joseph. But the, the truth of the matter is, is Joseph overcame so many, and he persevered in all of that stuff. You think Satan wasn't there trying to trip him every step of the way? You think Satan didn't say, hey, you know what? He'll never miss that amount of money. You know, you can get that guy to do that, and you don't have to do it because, hey, you have the authority and the power. Nobody will ever know. Who would blame you? Right? Who would blame you? He loved God. He loved God, and so he would not do those things. And he is, he's, he's a, a, was an absolutely 100% faithful man. So when he got to that high position, guess what? It was already built into him. It was already built in there. And we know the rest of the story when he says what? You guys intended it for evil for me to be here. But God overruled, and he wanted it for good, to save the whole family. He could finally see all the things, but... He had to see it by faith long before he ever got there. And it's the same thing here. When you are tempted, you have to look by faith, and you cannot look by what? Sight and go, well, temporary, I can get away with it. I can just ask for forgiveness. Don't do it. Consequences are too heavy. They are. Regret will come. So he said, uh, the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's the bottom line. Why do I love God? Well, I'll tell you for me, because he loves me. Right? I'm the caboose. He's the engine. 
right? But I still have that choice today to love God. I do. And that's my best what? Defense. That's my best defense is what? This relationship. I don't want to blow this. Anyway, let me get through some of these verses and some of the stuff I'm saying will, will make a whole lot more sense. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. What does that mean? It's an old nature. Um... Each person being drawn away. It's a lure. You're a fish, and Satan is a fisherman, and he knows you got a lure on the inside. So he loves to get in, you in a place where this old nature, you know, gets a little shiner flashing back and forth, and then you have a choice, right? Best to run away when you know the lure is just there and you're being tempted but that's the whole idea is um, I have a lure because I have an old nature I am to be victorious over the nature my old nature by feeding my new nature walking with the Lord and it makes this so much better but if I don't walk with the Lord, then I'm fair game. I'm absolutely fair game. Because I have no power. I'm not connected to my Savior. I'm weak, anemic, spiritually. And I won't have the power to resist. And a lot of people end up in that place a lot of Christians where they just say, no, nah, I don't want to do that stuff. I don't want to read. I don't want to do that stuff. I don't want to go to fellowship. Well, that ends up making you fair game. Just to be honest with you, it just makes you fair game. You don't want to be fair game. You don't. I know that you don't because of the consequences and the pain. And I've seen enough of it in my own life and enough of it in the people around me's lives to the point where it, it, just, it just, just totally broken lives with no remedy to come back from that because of the consequences are so heavy. Doesn't mean they're not saved. It's just they can't retain and gain back to the life that God intended for them. Too much water under the bridge, if you would have it. Um, so drawn away is a fishing lure. Uh, Proverbs 2, 10 through 22 speaks about the immoral woman. I'll read 18 and 19 for you. For her house leads down to death and her paths to the dead. None who go to her return, nor do they regain the paths of life. Now, predominantly this is sexual, but as I say, the, 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 with Joseph, it's not, sexual is not the only way that Satan can tempt us. He tempts us in lots of different ways. You know, finance is a huge one, power, you know, but uh, it says to those who go into this immoral woman, guess what? Nor do they regain the paths of life. You see, God wants us to have life. So he doesn't want us to what? Succumb to temptation because it leads to death. Spiritual death and ultimately physical death. Proverbs 5, 1 and 6. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey. 
That's like a temptation, wouldn't it be? It would be, right? That's the that's the 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 language that Solomon is using here. Um, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, and that's where you go, she is bitter as wormwood. Yuck. Sharp as a two-edged sword. Ah. Stabbed. Her feet go down to death and her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable and you do not know them. Now, I'm using, once again, sexual connotation, but that's, I mean, how many of you watch TV? What do they use to sell cars? <laughs> and I mean, what's on television these days? You know? Yeah. We all know. You know, the days of I Dream a Genie were risque in their day, but... Nothing like today, right? So he says, um, each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires. Um, yeah, and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown brings forth death. It's like having a baby. Where'd she go? It's like having a baby. So you start looking like David. Guess what? David's on the rooftop. David was fine before he got up there and kept looking. But then what? Sin entered in. Uh, conceived desire, birth to sin, failure, missing the mark, death, spiritual and physical. And it brought death to his family. It did. It brought death to Uriah. It destroyed his kingdom nearly. He didn't plan on any of that. He didn't. He didn't plan on any of it. He, 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 that, wasn't, that wasn't the deal. And so this is like what? You're birthing something, but it isn't good. And who's behind all of it? The unknown named guy here? It's Satan. Because he's the one that's there saying, This trial... This trial is a temptation. And every trial Satan will use as an opportunity for temptation. God is not good because you're in the middle of a trial. That's a big one. That's a huge one. You got to take matters into your own hand. Don't trust in the Lord. Uh, every trial, every relational trial that you have is an opportunity for what? Temptation. To repay someone in the same coin that they gave to you, right? Well, I'll just get you back with my own coins. I'm not supposed to do that. I'm supposed to let it go. Right? Lest I end up in the what? The warfare and the battle and all of a sudden I create a big mess. Because I got in my old nature. You know, I had an experience. Uh, my son Ben will be here, I, yeah, next Sunday. And uh, when he was young, uh, I had to go to Jack in the Box. For those of you who from the West, Jack in the Box, mystery meat tacos. Anyway, we were out shopping. I don't think there's really any meat in them, but that, that's what we call them. And I, I pulled into this jack-in-the-box, and uh, I think we had the Astro van at the time, and I pulled in, and I pulled up and parked, 
Well, my son opened the, the side door and got out, and I heard these tires squealing coming into the parking lot. So my hair went pshew. I was, I was, and I come running around the corner, and there he was standing at the corner of the, the van, thank God, and, uh, and uh, I just looked at him. I didn't say anything. He didn't do anything wrong. But then I watched the car go by, young guy. And, okay, so I'm riled. I'm ruffled. I'm not in a good disposition. I walk into Jack in the Box, and I'm standing there with my four-year-old, five-year-old son, and we're looking at the menu, and I'm figuring out how many tacos I want. I'll take 12, you know, 99 cents for two, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, and this guy, the same guy that squealed his tires, came into the parking lot like a banshee, walks right in front of me, and starts ordering. I'm already ruffled, I'm already riled, and I reached out my hand to grab him, and he turned around and he said, don't touch me. And do you know what happened? At that moment, God overcame me. I just smiled at him and said, you're absolutely right, I shouldn't touch you, go ahead and order. I said, I'm sorry. It was just the Holy Spirit just came on me because I was going to kill the guy in my old nature. And I, I'm, I'm a foreign, you know, I got a rough and tumble background. I, you know, but uh, so he ordered and he left, so I thought. And then I ordered, and I left, and by that time, I'm holding my son's hand. <laughs> and uh, I go out to the car, and I, this is how I know it was the Lord. The guy came walking over by himself, and he was with four people, and he asked for my forgiveness. Blew my doors. And I learned then, Lord... <laughs> You're in charge. <laughs> it's best that you just stay in charge, you know. And not that I was looking for the guy, but it was just, God just showed me something that, you know what, if I would just yield to him, he'll take care of it. And, um, you know, can you imagine if I didn't? Dennis Wadlow goes to jail, leaves his son, you know, <laughs> stuck a jack in the box. <laughs> and here I am, uh, an elder or the leader in my church. Oh, yeah, that would have gone over real big, huh? Let alone my wife sitting right there. Can you imagine <laughs> frying pan and, you know, knives and forks? What are you doing? Yeah, would nothing good would have come of anything of that. So God was good to me. Um, huh? Yeah, he did. So he says, um, verse 16, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning um, I need to remember a few things as I go through this life um, Jesus said John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So if you ever want to, want to know what the motive of Satan is, it's to do this. He wants to destroy us. He wants me to destroy myself, my old nature, and get into it. 
And that's what he always wants to do. So you need to be on guard. On guard and aware that that's what he wants to do. And not yield to the old nature. John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. Speaking to the Pharisees. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it all. And that's what he uses. He lies. He tells people, you can get away with it. Come on, we've all heard that thing. Whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It does not. It does not. You see, we send all our Navy, Army, Navy, Air Force personnel overseas to sin cities. And they went over and indulged their flesh because they were encouraged to do so, especially for those who were non-believers. And then they came back. Well, what did they bring? Those appetites. Those appetites. Appetites they couldn't satisfy in the, the United States. But they were cheap. And they were exceedingly sinful. And once you sowed those seeds, you had to live with them. And they carried a lot of those sins home. Sadly enough. Innocent what? 18, 19, 20 year old young men. Go have a party. Right? A liar. Satan's a liar. Absolutely. So, uh, did he lie to Eve? Absolutely. Did he lie to David? Oh, we don't see him in the picture, but he was there. He was there. Did he lie to Samson? Yeah. Samson deceived himself constantly. What about Solomon? Solomon's a different case in point, but he fell. He succumbed. He thought he was too wise. Hey, he was the wisest guy on planet Earth. A real wise guy. But he didn't use his own wisdom. He multiplied wives from what? Foreign countries. Built them temples for their other gods, which Israel never got freed from. Never. How many wives did he have? 700 wives? 1,000 women? Multiple choice. I mean, the guy writes in Ecclesiastes about his life. He said, I didn't withhold anything that I wanted to do from myself. He was the ultimate sex, drugs, and rock and roll guy in his lifetime. And if God hadn't been gracious for him, I don't think we would be seeing him in heaven. But uh, he came to his senses. God was gracious with him at the end. But boy, the seeds that he sowed, he personally may not have reaped a bunch of consequences from them, although I believe that he did. Look at the consequences he brought to the nation. Consequences they never got out of. Even in the days of Hezekiah, years and years and years, and king and king and king after that, they still on a hill opposite from Jerusalem. The Kidron Valley is there. There was still the temple for one of his pagan wives. She was still there at that time. They never got freed from the idolatry, which Manasseh took to the absolute extremes. And Solomon didn't help. 
It isn't now. So, um, so in verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Um, the ultimate goodness of any gift must be measured on an eternal scale. If you don't have eternity settled, then church will do you no good. The whole idea is get eternity settled first. Have eternal life. Turn your life over to Jesus Christ. Then the rest of it starts fitting together. Yes, there's temptations. Yes, there's trials. But there's trials whether you're a believer or whether you're not. You don't escape them. No shadow. The sun shines 724. So does God. The difference between the sun and God is one's created. But the sun has shadows that come in between. Right? The earth turns, or you have an eclipse, right? But it's still shining. It's just shining behind the eclipse, right? And so the, 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 the argument here, or the statement that he's making is God is always shining. He's always shining. He has no variation or shadow of turning. He's not fickle. Today he's there, tomorrow he's mad, etc. PM. You know, wrong side of the bed, hangover. That's not God. That's not God at all. In verse 18, of his own um, free will he brought us forth by the word of truth, so the word needs to be preached because it's the word of God that what the Holy Spirit's going to use to convict me and bring me to Jesus Christ. So the word of God is, is extremely important that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creature. He brought us forth. He caused us to be born again. I didn't bring myself forth. He did. So there's another birth here. There's another new beginning here. It's new nature. It's new nature. So we started old nature, new nature. I have the opportunity to walk in a new nature um, and to be victorious. That's what the Bible teaches. So... Um, he birthed us truth was synonymous for reality as a, opposite of illusion we live in a, a world of illusion we do the world speaks from illusion because it's under the sway of the devil I mean, there's constant, you know, constant what we see, what we hear, what goes on is not truth. This is truth. This is truth. This is what you hold on to. So first fruits, that's uh, a feast, a feast that we're ready to celebrate here next Sunday. We call it Resurrection Day. But it was a feast day for Israel. It always fell on a Sunday. Always did. It was designed like that. It's the 17th of Nizon. Not the, you know, not the Japanese car. But um, it's a new beginning. It was a new beginning when Jesus rose from the dead. He was the beginning of all those who would rise from the dead. Without him, 
Nobody would ever rise from the dead. That's why we celebrate. My hope is in Jesus Christ. His resurrection means I'm going to be resurrected. Let me give you a couple other dates for this 17th of Nisan, just to prove to you that God, God's in this date. Um, Noah's Ark safely rested on Mount Ararat on the 17th of Nisan. When it rested on Mount Ararat, the old world was gone. They were going to come out into the new world, right? So you have a new beginning, right? Unfortunately, old-natured sinners came off the new beginning boat, but that's, that's the way that it is, okay? Uh, the Hebrews entered Egypt... 430 years before the deliverance. Moses led the Israelites through the parting of the Red Sea. That was the 17th of Nisan, new beginning. When they came up through the Red Sea, before that, they were a bunch of slaves. When they came up on the other side, they were a nation. They were no longer slaves. They were set free. New beginning. Israel entered and ate the first fruit of the promised land in Joshua. Across the Jordan River, God, what? Stopped the Jordan River so they all could go across. As soon as they got across, he let the river go downstream. No going back. But then they started eating the fruit. It was a promise, a new beginning. They were entering into what? their land that God was going to give them and they were going to eat of the fruit so the cleansing of the temple by Hezekiah 800 years after entering the promised land 17th of Nisan Queen Esther saved the Jews from elimination the resurrection of the Messiah. Those are all significant dates, significant events. You see, the Jews under Esther were going to be wiped out by um, Haman. You're supposed to go, ah. that's what a Jew would do. Haman, he had a warrant to kill them all. And the king gave it to him. But Esther stepped in. She thought she might die doing it, but she said, okay, if I die, I die. And she goes in and persuades the king. And the king allows her to write her own law. So she wrote a law that said, well, we can go wipe out our enemies before the date of them wiping us out. And so it took a little bit of time to get all that around to the Jews, but then once they got it to the Jews, the Jews ambushed uh, Haman, who was an Agagite, and that's another story that I better not go down. But they wiped out their enemies. They were spared because they could have killed all the Jews and all of the realm of Persia. They had that kind of authority. And so God, what? Spared them. Gave them a new beginning, if you would have it. So, some of you are sitting here today, and I, maybe you're religious, you're here, you know, go to church or, or whatever. Uh, the Bible declares that uh, Jesus said this to the uh, Nicodemus. He said, you need to be born again. Nicodemus went, that doesn't make any sense. I'm already a big guy. I'm going to crawl back in my mother's womb. Well, a 
it's not like that, Nicodemus. You need to be born of the Spirit, not born of the flesh. You can't climb back up in there, buddy. You know? You need to be born from above. That means God does something when I trust in Jesus Christ and the fact that he made the payment for me, that he's the Son of God, that he died, that he was buried, that he rose from the dead, that I would put my faith in his Good Friday, we will celebrate his crucifix, which was his atonement for my sins, his payment for my ransom, your ransom. If you will trust him, then today could be your 17th of Nizam, your new beginning. There will be a couple of men up front to pray for you. If you would like to commit your way to Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to come up. Pray with these men. They'll lead you in a prayer. They'll explain it to you. But you don't want to leave here without getting eternity settled between you and God. So please, consider well what you do this day. Lord, thanks for your word. Thanks for those who came to hear it. We ask and pray, God, bless those who are here. For those who know you, Lord, help us to be able to stand because we love you. Get the victory in Jesus Christ. And if anybody doesn't know you, I pray that they would be bold enough to put feet to their faith and actually come up and pray and confess Jesus Christ and receive you as their Savior. Lord, I, I, you're so gracious. You're so good. You're so kind. Lord, you're leaning right over them right now, speaking to their hearts and saying, Come, come. So, Lord, bless us as we go out. In Jesus' name, amen.